Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Samantha Power. I'm the director of the Human Rights Initiative here at the Kennedy School. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here, although perhaps less of a pleasure to talk about what we'll be talking about. Um, the title of this evening's event, as you know, is Kosovo, What Do We Do Now? Um, I'm particularly pleased to present this panel because I think it reflects what we're trying to do here at the Human Rights Initiative in terms of um, presenting different voices from different worlds and having them tackle really the fundamental human rights policy questions of the day. Um, before I turn the microphone over to Graham Allison to introduce the panelists, um, I'd like to do two things. One, to make a brief announcement, a brief plug, in fact, and two, to offer a short history of kind of how we got here. And I say short, um, acknowledging that this is a place that we like to say has so much history it doesn't need a future. Um, but I will be brief. Um, first, the announcement. We are going to have a follow-up to this session tomorrow at lunchtime with Ambassador Morton Abramowitz, who will tackle a question almost as easy as the one we're tackling tonight, and that is, wither the Balkans. Um, Ambassador Abramowitz was U.S. Ambassador to Turkey. He was Assistant Secretary of State. And most recently, he was the advisor to the Kosovo delegation at the French peace talks in Ramallah. He will speak tomorrow at 1 p.m. in Land Hall, which is on the fourth floor of the Belfer Building next door. Now to the brief history. Um, again, another thing we like to say about this place is it's a place where nothing is learned and nothing forgotten. Um, and I think the panelists should perhaps keep this in mind also tonight as they think about prescribing for tomorrow um, and today. Uh, again, the reason for the history is, is that the panelists are going to focus their remarks on political, military, relief, humanitarian, human rights prescriptions. Um, but I think some of you may be new to Kosovo watching, so we're just going to start a little further back. Um, the Kosovo province, as many of you now know, uh, is a province of 1.8 million Albanians, 200,000 Serbs. Um, it is currently a province that is part of Serbia, one of two republics left within the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, formerly had six. Um, and it, Kosovo had autonomy granted to it in the 1974 Yugoslav Constitution. That autonomy, again, was revoked in 1989. In the aftermath of that rescinding, um, many Albanian language schools, cultural centers, and so on were closed. And many Albanians within Kosovo um, were deprived of basic civil and political liberties. A nonviolent separatist movement grew up um, under the leadership of Ibrahim Rugova, but had very little success in challenging the Serb regime in Belgrade. And in about 1996, a number of Kosovo Albanians decided to take up arms, and they came to comprise what we now know of as the Kosovo Liberation Army. Um, beginning early last year, the Serbs responded to the growth of this force with a military and police crackdown that resulted in the loss of several thousand Albanian lives, though the numbers um, are hard to come by. And more importantly, perhaps for the long term, the conversion of many Albanians to this idea that force was the way to make change in Kosovo. Um, Tensions escalated in October of 1998. Richard Holbrook brokered a deal that basically uh, provided for a Serb retreat from the province and the deployment of these 2,000 international verifiers. Um, this deal broke down rather quickly and fell apart completely in January uh, when 45 ethnic Albanians were massacred in Rachak. Um, at that point, the US, Britain, France, Germany, and Russia summoned the parties to France to conduct peace talks. And these peace talks, the, the deal on the table, and there was virtually only one deal on the table, that was uh, restoring autonomy, though not independence, to Kosovo, and replacing the Serb units in Kosovo with NATO forces. The Kosovo Albanians belatedly, but eventually signed the accord. And as we know, the Serbs refused on the grounds that NATO troops should not set foot on Yugoslav soil. Um, fed up. NATO began bombing on March the 24th, exactly two weeks ago tonight, targeting Serbian air defenses, industrial facilities, government buildings in Belgrade, and increasingly, more recently, Serb units on the ground uh, doing the cleansing that we know is going on in, in Kosovo proper. Um, 
The bombing, as we know, has unleashed this wave of ethnic cleansing, and, or at least helped unleash, and killings um, unseen in Europe, cleansing and killings unseen in Europe for half a century, which is often said, with refugees pouring across the border, Serb units on the rampage, and Russia increasingly testy, and with NATO showing few signs of relenting, we pose the question tonight, what do we do now? Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Graham Allison, who will moderate the panel. Uh, Graham is the, Professor Allison, I should say, is the uh, chairman of the Human Rights Initiative and the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. He's also the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government here and the former dean. He was dean from 77 to 1989. He was also an assistant secretary of defense and is, specializes in foreign, American foreign policy, defense, and U.S.-Soviet relations. So without further ado, <laughs> Professor Allison. Th thank you very much, Samantha, and uh, thanks to Samantha and her team in the Human Rights Initiative, which is, a, as she said, a new initiative here at the school in its first year, and actually, uh, uh, managing to bring to the school events like this one. So we thank her very much. Uh, and thank the members of the team that put this together. We have a terrific panel tonight and a very, very tough question. The question is, in Kosovo, what should the U.S. or the allies, or maybe even somebody wants to say people, you know, like us, what should we do now? Focusing on policy in particular, and policy by the governments involved. And to address this, uh, we have uh, not, we're not going to have a unanimous uh, voice. In fact, I think part of what we'll see is that the confusion that each of us feels in our own m minds and hearts is because this is a complicated problem. But we certainly have four excellent voices to get us started here, and then we hope to have a very active conversation. The lead off for the panel will be uh, Anna Husakara, sorry, Husraska, excuse me, apologies, excuse me. Uh, Anna is a distinguished journalist who's a staff writer at the New Yorker, a special correspondent at the New Republic, and a political analyst at the ICG. Just uh, in case you haven't been reading lately, if you pick up this week's New Yorker, you'll see a piece on Kosovo by Anna. Or if you look in last week's New Republic, you'll see a piece on Burma. Or if you want to read about Poland, you can look at yesterday's Wall Street Journal. So she's prolific, and she's been an active analyst, particularly as part of the ICG, on this whole subject of Bosnia and Kosovo. Uh, secondly will come uh, Bill Nash. Bill is a former uh, Major General in the U.S. Army, was a fellow here at the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School last year has just recently joined the National Democratic Institute, where he's directing their global civil military programs. General Nash was the commanding general of the US Army's first armored division, which was stationed in Bosnia from June 96 to May 97. And prior to that, from, May, from December 95 to November 96, he served as commander of Task Force Eagle, which was a multinational division from 12 nations charged with implementing the Dayton Peace Accords in northeastern Bosnia-Herzegovina. After Bill, we'll turn to Jennifer Lenning. Jennifer is a, what I would say a real doctor. Okay? She's an MD. She's an assistant professor at the medical school. Uh, she's a senior research fellow at the Harvard Center for Population Development Studies. She's a member of the board of the directors for the Board of Directors for the Physicians for Human Rights. And at the School of Public Health at Harvard, she teaches about disaster management and responses to humanitarian crises. The final panelist is Steve Van Evra. Steve is a professor of political science at MIT. He's a distinguished strategist and analyst of military affairs. His new book, which will come out next July, is called Causes of War, Power and Realities of Conflict. So I think we couldn't have a better group. Uh, I know that their opinions differ uh, substantially. Uh, the main thing that I would remind them and remind you is that initially they have five minutes 
only five minutes, to offer their view what should be done now. We'll then have an opportunity for some discussion and debate, and then we're going to have an active discussion from the whole group. So thank uh, uh, and join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific group. First, you can just sit here. Okay. Uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, first, I would like to make a comment and the correction. The correction is don't turn this clock. Okay. The correction is that I am no more with ICG, and the comment is because I'm very, very bitter about political analysis leading nowhere. Another comment is that you give me five minutes to tell you what to do with Kosovo, and this is part of the problem. <laughs> I spent two years on Kosovo and I'm still looking for answers, so five minutes is very little. I will therefore limit myself to, to the prescriptions. I will have to a little bit address the, the problems in the past. I think that part of the five minutes approach to Kosovo led to many politicians not having the patience to understand what it is and what were the problems. I am not referring to the famous uh, President and Vice President saying that those are centuries old problems that cannot be solved really. I'm rather uh, referring to having patience to put together a good group in, uh, from uh, the Kosovo Albanian side uh, so that they can face Milosevic in possible negotiations. Uh, I also would like to make a reference to what Samantha said about the, the, the lack of success of Mr. Rugova's peaceful movement. I think that this movement was peaceful, but it was also very, very passive. And for us journalists, if I may put the other hat, it did not give enough opportunity to report on it. For three years I was going back to my editors and they would always tell me that I've already written the story about the underground society in Kosovo, therefore uh, they are not going to run my piece. And this goes for absolutely everybody for whom I wrote. <laughs> Uh, the, the prescriptions then, I think that uh, I, I will leave to, to Bill to deal with the with moving pins on maps approach to, to Kosovo <laughs> and I will try to, uh, to do a little bit of the analysis of, of, of the situation uh, in the hearts and minds of the people that, are the, that we are dealing with. I think that there was a big mistake and underestimation of uh, Slobodan Milosevic's uh, uh, readiness to commit uh, suicide on a national scale. Uh, his mother, his father, and his father's brother committed suicide. I, this man is not very new to suicide. And in a way, he goes um, va bank for those of you who play poker in French. It means you just put all your money on. On, on one card. I think he went and I think that there wasn't enough analysis of how he was preparing. Uh, very often the State Department would say that we have learned a lesson from Bosnia. I think that uh, Milosevic has learned a better lesson from Bosnia and the lesson is uh, that some crimes he can be prosecuted for and others he cannot or he can get away and he will probably get away with this because he's doing it without anybody looking. Uh, I think that therefore that what we should be looking at is trying to find uh, psychologically or, or um, trying to, to gain the, 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 the Serb people. If, if Madeleine Albright can speak Serb, I think she should have spoken to the Serb people before she started uh, bombing, or not she really, but in <laughs> a way of speaking. Um, and it, it came a little bit late. I think that, that the whole opposition in Serbia is completely lost. It's in hiding, they've emigrated, they don't dare, they have censorship. It's, it's, it's lost. There is nobody to speak to in Serbia as, as I uh, see it. I also think that Kosovo Albanians, uh, the support that the, especially the US administration but also the European Union gave to Rugova was a mistake. I think that in the future we should be choosing other elements within the, within the um, Kosovo Albanian society. I have been writing those prescriptions since 17th of February last year about uh, finding some other partners than Mr. Rugova. I think that another good idea, which you may not see on all the uh, uh, shows uh, in which 
people now have very many opinions on Kosovo, uh, a completely forgotten element is the Serbs from Kosovo. Those are people that were not represented in Rambouillet and it's in the name of the Serbs that live in Kosovo that Kosovo is not turned to Albanians. So they could eventually be used. They are anti-Milosevic or were until the bomb started falling. I don't know what the bomb falling on you makes to your psyche. But they were anti-Milosevic anti until recently. And they could have been used. This is Bishop Bartemia, whom you may have seen a very uh, a media savvy uh, called Cyber Monk, uh, Father Sava. He goes on the web. It's thechani.com. Probably quite a few of you have visited his site. He's very good on that. I also think that we could appeal to another uh, partner, which is uh, Montenegro. I'm going there tomorrow afternoon, so I'll. I'll see and, and report on this. But I think that this was a, a good foothold and we could have done something by gaining the, the sympathy and, uh, and uh, probably flooding Montenegro right now with aid, even in a, in a bigger scale than um, what, what would be due to them because of the percentage of the refugees they receive. The, if we gave them a lot of money in aid to, to, to handle the refugees, I think that there would, it would be easier to get their sympathy. Uh, Montenegro is also the other republic of Yugoslavia, as Samantha pointed out, but it is the other republic that has Albanians inside, and the Albanians in Montenegro have been uh, collaborating with the, with the government, with Mr. Djukanovic and even before. They have ministerial posts, they have schools in Albania, they participate in the elections, uh, they, they carry Yugoslav passports just like the Albanians from Kosovo, but they recognize the, um, the sovereignty of, of the state of Yugoslavia over them. So this is an example that Albanians within Yugoslavia could exist. They are not happy people. Uh, but who's happy in the Balkans these days? Uh, I, oh, one. Then, so I will quickly, I hope you will ask me plenty of questions, please, yes. because I have a lot to say. Uh, the, the hearts and minds of the, people, uh, of the people in the UCK, the Kosovo Liberation Army, uh, should be gained also, otherwise they are going to, to escape us. Those are people who have uh, had the dream of, of of independent Kosovo for a long time, and uh, they, they don't necessarily have a very sophisticated political plan for the future. They want their independence, and the more Milosevic shows uh, how he is treating his minority, the more uh, independence they deserve. Uh, this, however, this independence, and I, two weeks ago I, I, I wrote a piece calling for the arming of the Kosovo Liberation Army, saying that it's the ground forces of the Kosovo Liberation Army that could do the job. Uh, I, I don't think that, that this is now feasible. Bill will know more with those pins and things. But, but Probably uh, there, is, there is the danger if, the, if there is an independent Kosovo that it will lead to, to the greater Albania that so many people are afraid of. I think that the greater Albania happened last week on, on our television screens because there was never such a mixture of Albanians from Macedonia with Albanians from Albania with Albanians from Kosovo with Albanians from Greece and now Albanians are being sent to Greece and, and it is a greater Albania. We just don't want to recognize the, this fact, but de facto it is, and the mixture is very big. And I think I'll get into trouble if I thank, continue. Thank you for, uh, thank you for a, a good start, and you, this is not the last we're going to hear from any one of the panelists. Let me turn to General Nash a second. Thank you, Graham. Well, if uh, analyzing uh, Kosovo in uh, five minutes is bad, uh, trying to frame your discussion in the movement of pins on a map is even worse. Uh, last night on the news hour, uh, Frank Carlucci, former Secretary of Defense, uh, observed that uh, in war there should be clarity of ends and your means should be obscured. He then commented that in this particular case we seem to have reversed the formula. And I would say to you that the clarity of our political goal is problematic at best. 
The refugee crisis has resulted in a spasmodic call for send in the ground troops. Uh, and I ask the question, to what end? Uh, arming the uh, UCK or the uh, Kosovo Liberation Army uh, is an option. It is also, I believe, tantamount to stating that the political goal is an independent Kosovo. Uh, if that is the decision, it should so be uh, uh, clarified. Limited objectives are legitimate in the pursuit of national interests, but decisive force to achieve said objectives is also legitimate. Uh, the self-limiting uh, self statements uh, ref with respect to ground troops at the beginning of this operation uh, and possible hints at least uh, on limited time duration of the operation have had strategic and operational implications that have been self-limiting to our success. Uh, what to do? Uh, for now, stay, in, stay the course. Uh, wonderful turn of the phrase that Tom Friedman used yesterday, give war a chance. Uh, <laughs> never did I think I'd read that anywhere. Uh, I think we need to have a general uh, consensus building uh, on the uh, clarification of political goals. Is it autonomous or an independent Kosovo? And what we, want, what we need to decide what we want it to look like when it is over, or what process is established when we finish the military operations. Then we must seek to achieve coincidence of military objectives that will achieve political goals. And then once we set those goals, we should provide a decisive force to achieve them. I believe we should get the Russians involved and back in the fold as far as the partnership in pursuit of this uh, objective, and I think we must look to a Balkans-wide solution. I have given back the rest of Anna's time. Sir. Thank you. Very, uh, very direct and very clear. Uh, so, uh, please. Well, that's what I get paid for. Well, Jennifer, I, uh, you're next. Yep. Yes, thank you. I, is this on? Can yes. you hear me? Okay. Uh, there are two humanitarian crises unfolding now in the Kosovo region, and I'm including the border area. Uh, one is within Kosovo, and the other is in the uh, spillover from the enormous number of refugees who have fled the area. And they, they both create uh, very core challenges of, of timely response on the part of the international community. Uh, I and actually many people in the human rights field uh, tend to look at a situation from two perspectives. That is, uh, why are we here and what could have been done to prevent us from being here? Partly, perhaps largely, in order to improve one's comprehensive analysis and response the next time you're faced with um, a set of rapidly unfolding uh, problematic situations. And then the second perspective is, now that you're here, what do you do? And there are a number of painful forks in the road, or um, arborizations of the road, as one looks back just in the last year, in terms of uh, the international community's response to the um, simmering war in Kosovo that had um, its share of atrocities and had an escalation built into it after the October 15th, after the mid-October agreement between Holbrook and Milosevic. A number of times before and then many times afterwards when the international community could have seen that Milosevic was intent on wiping out that population. And there are a number of ways in which the international community could have intervened diplomatically, politically, and militarily to avoid being in the cul-de-sac we reached on um, mid-March and then certainly by March 24th, when we basically were facing a heavily militarized Kosovo, uh, extensively settled by over 400 tanks, between 40 and 45,000 heavily armed Yugoslav regular soldiers, thousands of uh, special force uh, police from the Ministry of the Interior, also very heavily armed. The word police is, is, conveys the wrong um, sense to people in the United States. These guys carried Kalashnikovs, had knives, wore boots, were um, extremely 
um, revved to commit atrocity. And they were on a very tight leash. Uh, we have been, uh, as in Physicians for Human Rights, we have been in the Kosovo area for three or four times over this last year, and then from the perspective of the Balkans, have a long history of watching Milosevic and pleading, urging, um, calling upon the international community to do a number of things uh, to try to halt, prevent what he's doing or to bring him to account for what he has done. The pattern of what he was doing was patently clear. And by mid-March, with the collapse of the Paris talks, the second post Rambouillet talks, um, it was evident to everyone in Kosovo that war, A, was coming, but from a human rights perspective, was necessary. There was no way to stop Milosevic from continuing his assaults on the civilian population in Kosovo without a military armed force, not just equal to, but obviously better than the 45,000 Yugoslavian troops, the tanks, the control of the air, and the control of transport that they had at that point. It was also evident to all of us, you did not have to be a military expert, it was also evident to all of us that an air campaign would not be enough. Now when we got back, <clears throat> I was there until March 19th, we got back, bombing started March 24th, the OSCE verifiers, the 1400 international people with the 1500 local people, Serbs and Albanians, that they had enlisted in the work. They were pulled out on March 20th, and that was like pulling out the control rods from a nuclear power plant. They had been able to sustain losing their grip on accountability and capacity to keep the violence to a low simmer as the militarization of Kosovo accelerated in the late fall and winter, but they still had an influence. And when they were pulled out, for obvious reasons, because they would have been prime hostages if the bombing took place, et cetera, the delay between March 20th and March 24th was excruciating to those of us who knew what was going to happen because we knew there was going to be a release on the Serbian forces side within Kosovo. So it is right to say that the atrocities that have been committed and are now in gross form rampant throughout Kosovo, it is right to say that the NATO bombing did not start it. The NATO bombing, however, accelerated and the delay in starting it allowed the Serbian forces to achieve a substantial foothold in their campaign of obliterating the society of Kosovo. So from the standpoint of the policy cul-de-sac that you're in in mid-March, and from a human rights standpoint, which is interested in protecting civilian populations, upholding the rule of law, trying to call upon the world to recognize violations of conventions and act upon them wherever the conventions call for implementation. From a human rights standpoint, it was absolutely essential to say that there had to be a very, very decisive military response at that point. And so the political goal would have been to protect the civilian population the military uh, means would have been a decisive military force to stop Milosevic from his predation in Kosovo. It would have required a recognition that there would need to be a reconsideration of Rambue because at that point you could not go back to an autonomous province. Too much had happened. So that's one thing to do with the internal crisis. What we are saying is continue the bombing to the extent that it will now be part of a ground invasion, launch a ground invasion, as ugly and difficult as that is, and we could have some very interesting conversations with the military people here, we know how difficult it is, uh, but this is the point at which one needs to act because we are saying that genocide is now being conducted upon the civilian population in Kosovo, and genocide requires an international communal response. In terms of the refugee crisis, there are grave issues of human rights abuses taking place interlaced with public health failures and underscored by tremendous political <coughs> complexity. Every refugee response to something this fast, this rapid, and this huge takes about a week to three weeks to get up and running. That's what it's taking. The international community is not behaving any worse in terms of its humanitarian response than it's ever done. In fact, it's doing it a lot better and a lot faster. The major issue is the Macedonian government and another major issue is the separation of families that is occurring because of the machinations, political as well as logistic, in terms of dealing with these populations. There is going to be an enormous amount of work for thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people of goodwill in countries that are lucky, like us, 
to support the international humanitarian community in the work that now lies ahead for not months, years in dealing with the refugee population. But the first point that we would like to make about these two linked crises is that the refugee crisis should not distract us from dealing with the fundamental crisis, which is now a military, political, and human rights one. Can I just say one more point, that in the, in the human rights issues relating to the refugees, we would insist that all political efforts be made to allow the speedy return of the greatest number of Alma Albanian refugees from Kosovo back to their homeland. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Steve uh, Van Everach uh, for our fourth comment. Thank you, Graham. I'll make four points. One point is about what I think we should do immediately to, tomorrow uh, uh, in the military area. And the second, uh, and third and fourth points are all about what we should be doing in the weeks ahead, looking down the road. Uh, uh, and my first, just to summarize before I speak, my first point is I think it's uh, now necessary immediately to go to a ground war and realize that uh, uh, an air campaign is going to fail to accomplish our goals. The second, third, and fourth points deal with the fact that we have three conflicts in former Yugoslavia that are either active or are latent but are uh, uh, someday possibly going to be active. And we should think about uh, how we're going to deal with all three of them, one being in Kosovo, one being in Bosnia, and one being in Macedonia. And uh, the three are related, and let me remark on all three and what I think we should be um, looking ahead to in terms of uh, treating all three of these conflicts. So the first point about the ground war, and I won't say much about that. Uh, those of you who watch Jim Lehrer and CNN, there's been a great deal said about uh, the history of bombing, and I simply want to echo that, that um, social science has things to say about uh, the military force we're now applying in Bosnia. Uh, Robert Pape. Uh, of Dartmouth University has written an excellent book surveying the entire history of bombing in the 20th century. There's been a great deal of it, and the record is stunningly clear, stunningly clear, that bombing of the kind we're doing in Kosovo will fail. Um, it will fail for two reasons. First of all, it's, it's punishment bombing, and uh, uh, bombing to punish uh, uh, almost never works. The kind of bombing that works is bombing that removes the opponent's ability to do what you don't want them to do. But the idea of punishing others into doing what you do is a, something that fails uh, historically. The second thing is that use of air power without uh, uh, accompanying use of ground forces traditionally fails. And the reason there is that air power can't find forces on the ground unless they are forced somehow to concentrate and present a target. And uh, unless there's an opponent on the ground that's pressing them to concentrate, then they can scatter and hide and they're very hard to find. And so uh, without any accompanying ground action in Kosovo, it's going to be very hard for our air power to uh, really make a difference against the uh, Serb forces. So if we want to accomplish our goals, I think we have to move now to a ground war. Now about looking down the road, three points about dealing with Kosovo and Bosnia and uh, Macedonia. And I think all three of these deal with the question of partition and whether we have to face up to partition. Our whole approach to ethno-national conflicts has usually been to try to uh, put the pieces back together. Uh, uh, the Rodney King solution, uh, can we all get along? Let's, let's see if differences can be reconciled, uh, if uh, uh, multi-ethnic states can be put back together. I think that in the case of Kosovo, it's clear that we have a marriage that can't be saved. I also think that in Bosnia, we have a marriage that in the end can't be saved except at great expense to ourselves. Uh, and again, what does social science say about this? What's the history on this? Uh, there's an excellent article written by Heim Kaufman that appeared in International Security, which uh, Graham's uh, center published some years ago on the record of um, uh, ethno-national conflict and when these conflicts could be resolved. When could multi-ethnic states be put back together and when they couldn't? And one of the key uh, uh, factors that he discovered in his article was how much blood is there on the floor? It matters a great deal what history uh, the two parties have made for each other. Uh, if you have a history that's um, one of uh, small slights and insults, as in uh, uh, Canada between the French and the Anglo-Canadians, you can save the marriage. If you have hip deep in blood, as you do in Bosnia, it's another matter. And in the end, uh, things will fall apart. And I think in Kosovo, we have to step up, realize Rambouillet formula has to be abandoned, not only in light of all the horrors that have unfolded in the last two weeks and are unfolding tonight, 
Um, but what if, which have unfolded since 1912. If you go back and uh, uh, know the history of what happened when the Serbs first went in in 1912, what happened in World War II, uh, what happened after that, and uh, this is really the fourth or fifth round. So this is a marriage that can't be saved. Now I also think we should uh, open our minds to rethinking uh, the Dayton Accords, because I think they're failing. Uh, what we really have in Dayton today is a, um, a millstone that we cannot get rid of. There is no American plan today for terminating our involvement in Bosnia. Uh, I think it's clear that the parties in Bosnia are not working toward the creation of a functioning uh, unified society. There's been very little return of refugees. There's no functioning central state. Uh, and there is this ugly history that Kaufman talks about in his articles. Tremendous killing has happened between the parties in Bosnia. Uh, uh, over uh, not only the years since 91, but since uh, uh, going back to World War II. And uh, we should open our minds to the notion, and we tied down uh, roughly a brigade of troops, and if you total the troops that are engaged there, we have to remember there's rotation involved, so maybe a division worth of troops that have to be engaged in Bosnia. We have to find our way out of that somehow. And uh, one possibility, I think, would be to consider a, a kind of a grand bargain with the Serbs, which is to say, fine, you guys like the national principle. You guys have been telling us that's how you want to order things. We'll give it to you in Bosnia, and we're going to take it away from you in, in Kosovo. So a kind of carrot and stick approach. The third point I'd make is about Macedonia. I'll be very quick, which is I think our mission there has to be to save Macedonia from partition. Uh, and it's not obvious to me that in the end that society isn't going to fail as well. It's, uh, uh, it's got a better history than the other two. Great killing hasn't occurred between the parties. On the other hand, you have severe discrimination against the Albanians by the central government. 5% of the military, 10% of the central administration are Albanian, whereas a third of the population <clears throat> is Albanian. Uh, and it should be a central element of our national policy to tell the Albanians, this must stop. You must have a policy of, of power sharing and of, of fairness in administration. Uh, otherwise, we're looking forward to uh, a, an additional huge problem in Macedonia someday. So I'll stop with that. Good. So, uh, as I said, I was sure we would have a unanimous opinion here, and I'm sure we don't uh, on the panel or in the audience either. Uh, I want to give the members of the panel an opportunity to uh, disagree uh, or to make a brief comment on each other's comments if they would like to do. But before they do, I also would like to have a first comment or question from our new colleague uh, here, Rude Lubbers. Rude just showed up. Uh, the day before yesterday, he's the former Prime Minister of the Netherlands and teaches a course here at the Kennedy School. And I asked him yesterday, just as he got off the plane, why is this not the Europeans' problem and why aren't they fixing it? So, Ruud, uh, why don't you uh, uh, offer us, just maybe use that microphone there, uh, please. Graham, thank you. Just. Uh, few short remarks. First, I want to pay contribute, contribute um, to the fact that this is organized by the Human Rights Initiative, Samantha Powers. This is something very special for me because we are discussing a NATO problem. And still we find it normal that it is put in the perspective, and that is the right perspective, of human rights. This is my first remark. This brings me back Ten years ago, I was already a number of years in office as Prime Minister and Cold War. There was the question, how to go on with NATO? What's our new mission? That question was asked by the then Secretary General Werner, who was, had cancer and passed away shortly after. But he was passionately asking all of us, redefine the mission of NATO. Let's be frank, we did not. Five years later, we were Washington Partnership for Peace. We agreed in Brussels about that. It was a NATO summit. And for students here, very shortly, Partnership for Peace basically in the beginning was enlargement of NATO, but at the very same time, partnership with the other Central and East European countries to cope with questions of security and peace together. What happened is that we enlarged NATO, but we did not develop the partnership. Thirdly, 
After that, many, including myself, made a plea to reorganize the political system and to say, if we are responsible from now on as NATO for peace and security and human rights also out of NATO area, all over Europe, then we need a partnership between Moscow, Brussels, European Union, and Washington. It failed. At the end of the day, we were all conventional. And we said we have NATO with the leadership of the United States, and that will suffice. Next remark. Then we are in this crisis, tremendous crisis. And for me, as a former politician, I simply cannot understand how people in Washington could be so naive, as Stephen said, that you could win such a thing with an airstrike only. Impossible. And how could our commander-in-chief declare in public that he was not going to use ground troops? And how, as a politician, I ask myself, he did not consult the leaders of the House what to do. And even when they would have said, we are not going there with troops. We're all living here in America with the Mogadishu trauma. Let's be fair, not hypocrite about it. Even then, it would have been better. Then he would have had the chance to ask them today at his office and see what the consequences are of the non-preparedness to go there with troops. And that's what you ask me, Graham, to be specific. Of course we have to go there. We are much too late. We are much too late. That's the answer. It's not the only answer. That's the military answer. Behind that is the political answer. Here are four experts. They are not experts. They are not consulted by the president, I guess. But I gave you some, a few clues that when it comes to politics, it's essential. After, of course, that you have done what you have to do, military, that you work together with others, including the Russians. Yes, including the Russians. And there are possibilities to do so, I'm convinced. I could say more. I end where I began. I'm really happy that this is seen now at the Kennedy School, not in the perspective of a security problem for NATO itself, not in the perspective of the so-called vital interests of the United States, but basically in terms of human rights. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruud. And we will all have the good fortune here in the community of having Prime Minister Lubbers here with us for the next month. So uh, welcome. Uh, let me see if any members of the panel want to make a brief comment on any of the comments that they heard. Otherwise, we'll turn to uh, the audience. Uh, I, I have a Please. quick comment uh, about Steve's proposal to exchange, basically, Republika Srpska, which is part of Bosnia, for Kosovo. Uh, I would like him to go and speak to the to the Bosniaks, the Muslims that used to live in Republika Srpska, and tell them that that's the solution and and get away with it. I d I don't think we have the right to tell those people that there will not be any possibility for them to go back home because we are solving or trying to solve a new crisis by attending to a pre by making worse the previous one. Any other thoughts? Uh well, the uh, focus on human rights, I think, that um, we've just heard about is an interesting one to note uh, in the list of objectives that uh, President Clinton gave and also that uh, the NATO leadership has given. Uh, it began with, as they say, it's a humanitarian objective. There's the need to protect civilians. You know, that was the first major reason. They didn't use the word human rights, they used the word humanitarian. And they're still using the word humanitarian, although that's sliding off a bit. And you're now hearing um, increasingly the, um, the degrade and diminish, et cetera, language that is becoming pretty tedious. And uh, behind the humanitarian, however, really what the word is that, that um, Clinton, at least, is still reluctant to use is, is human rights. And NATO 
commentators around NATO, people within NATO, the Europeans are much more ready to use that word and to say, you know what, NATO, NATO needs to be about helping to stabilize, secure, enforce a rule of law and support for human rights throughout Europe. And kicking and screaming reluctantly, uh, not really the leader intellectually at all in this NATO initiative, the United States is coming in, but they're still cloaking it in the word humanitarian. I do not mean to diminish the word humanitarian, but at some point tonight we might want to talk about the difference. And the, I would say that the difference comes out really clearly when you talk to people who are humanitarians about the need for ground troops. And off record, they will say, God, yes, those who've been there. But they can't say it on the record, because humanitarians, it's very difficult to say you have to shed blood in order to save lives. In human rights, if you work within doctrine and documents and rules and established norms, at some point you have to say that you need to shed blood to save lives in the service of larger values. Good. Let me, let me put a question, if I could, both to Bill and to, uh, and to Steve uh, on the proposition that seems to be growing. Uh, about uh, the notion that uh, ground troops should go to fight a war against Serbia in order to liberate Kosovo. I guess that's the proposition. And so the first, if I understand what this involves, it's uh, NATO's plan is a couple of hundred thousand troops. That is 150 or 200,000 troops. It would take three months to get them into position in which case there won't be anybody left, I presume, uh, of the Kosovars uh, in Kosovo. Uh, they'll then engage in warfare with the, uh, with the Serb army. Uh, presumably the estimate of casualties is surely hundreds on the Allies side and maybe thousands. Uh, so if this, is, this is the prescription and to what end, okay? What do you say, Bill? And, and Steve as well, and then you all too. But since they were, they were proposing that, that's why I'm pushing them on it. Well, first of all, to what end was my question, Graham, damn it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so you're, if you're not subscribing to this, well, uh, to this uh, prescription, wanna, yeah. you don't have to tell to what end. But if you are, <laughs> I need to know, what do you want? Do you well, want one Kosovo of the back, or you want a part of it, it back, or you want Got Serbia, it. or you want Milosevic? Uh, um, one of the points I'd like to make and, and, uh, is that for all those that in previous earlier days called for, you know, bomb the Serbs, send in the ground forces, everybody knew a ground attack wouldn't work or an air attack by itself wouldn't work. And that's true. It'll be very interesting to read the history of the military advice that was given to the president and the political interactions and dynamics took place. Okay. Uh, because I, best I know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have read some of those books about air power. <laughs> but, I w but if the Serbs launched a campaign of terror and genocide upon the initiation of an air attack, what would they have done during the buildup of a NATO ground force and the preparatory fires preceding a ground attack? Okay. So please don't assume, don't, don't fall into the trap that if we had done one thing different, it all would have been okay. All right? And, and, and to fall into that logic is, is dangerous and foolish. So the, the, the issue that, I've, that I raised to what end, Graham, is that if the objective is to free Kosovo, a la free Kuwait, Fine. Uh, should the objective be uh, destroy Serbia, free Serbia of its current regime and military power? That is called a war, a big war that will, that will do everything that we want to prevent in the Balkans as far as expanding confrontation and, and the like. Not necessarily should be eliminated from our menu, but should be seriously considered uh, prior to implication. So, so the ground attack, and the only other thing I would say, and it's kind of uh, impacts on so, so what, what the uh, Prime Minister said, 
is that there were 18 other nations in the room, uh, and not all of which I think were eager for the compromise solution that was, was found. So we must recognize the difficulty not only with domestic politics, uh, but also with, the, with 18 other domestic politics and the 19 nations coming to a conclusion. Uh, and it's hard to find perfection when you're balancing all of those considerations. Steve? Well, I think there are really four arguments for being there. One is that if we uh, don't resolve this war, uh, Europe is going to face a serious refugee crisis. Now, we aren't, but we're part of the NATO community, and we have to consider the welfare and interests of our allies as well as when we ask them to do it in the reverse. And so uh, this is a practical problem. The second is this is a human rights catastrophe of a large order, and we should from time to time be willing to use our strength uh, for human rights. Um, not always, not often, but there are occasions for it. And if the catastrophe is huge, then I think we should act. The third is credibility. We would look ridiculous if we failed after this much um, uh, U.S. commitment. Uh, and fourth is the issue of war spread. I don't buy the scenarios that this war could spread all the way to engulf the Greeks and the Turks and, you know, 1914 all over again. But I do think this war could spread to Macedonia, and this uh, Macedonia could be destabilized if uh, it is flooded with uh, highly radicalized uh, Albanian refugees. This will not make pe things more peaceful there. I will say, though, in terms of what's coming up, I think two other points. One is I think that the 200,000 number is way too big. Um, that's a real kind of a caution number that the uh, uh, military folks have been putting out. I think a much smaller number will be enough. Um, uh, this won't be an easy war, by the way, but I also don't think people should imagine the Korean War all over again. This is a war not as favorable to our um, liking as the Gulf War, but it's a war which doesn't present the aspects of war that Americans should most fear. There's not going to be a guerrilla war. There's no hostile sea of population in uh, Kosovo in which the adversary can hide. And that's what we're worst at, counterinsurgency. Well, we're not going to face one here. And so far as there's a sea of population, it's totally hostile to the Serbs. That's their problem. The Serbs are not combat experienced. These guys are good at, at, at shooting uh, people in the head and uh, breaking arms, but they've never been in a war. Their friends in Serbia in uh, Bosnia have, but they haven't. And their equipment is poor. Uh, they have uh, junky Soviet equipment. So I think this is a, a war that we, we, will, we will take some losses here, but uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, we're not fighting Korea all over again. I'll say a third point, though. I think that maybe today we've just seen the first major political move by Milosevic that's going to cause a big problem for us. I think he's now pulling a booby on, if you will. Okay, remember in the Gulf War, everyone was frightened that at some point uh, Saddam would offer concessions that would seem reasonable to most of the coalition, and the coalition would fall apart. He would agree to pull back, except to hold Bouillon Island and the northern oil field, and then, hey, coalition falls apart. Well, the news today says that the refugees lined up in their hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands on the road have vanished, uh, and the reports are that they've been told to go home at gunpoint by the Serbs which sounds to me like perhaps Milosevic has decided he's going to end the refugee crisis. He's going to end it. And then he's going to say to us, what's your excuse for invading? You no longer have these refugees roaring in their hordes toward your borders. Um, uh, a major reason for war has now disappeared. Now, now do you have the, the uh, will to invade me? And I think we have to make a decision. Are we going to go forward after that? And I would say, yes, we should, because I think we have to end this running sore. We have to stop this conflict. It's never going to stop until Kosovo is separated from Serbia. Okay. Anna, you want to make a comment on this question or on yeah. different? Yeah, yeah. please. Uh, if you, uh, first, um, first about the, the liberation of uh, Kuwait and liberation of Kosovo. Uh, I, I don't think that, that the comparison stands because of the political problems. The, this, uh, this administration and the, the, the outside world does not want to recognize that the goal of independence of Kosovo is a right goal. Therefore, there is nothing to be liberated. This was not an independent country before, so we would not to whom do we turn it? We liberate and then do what with it? Well, we, give keep, it we keep it uh, as a protectorate, uh, presumably like Bosnia. Yes? Give it, 
Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> Ka Carlos Westendorp has got enough problems, I think, from Sarajevo. I wouldn't put another thing of him. I, I don't, I, I think that, that the goal is, is, is a good goal and this goal should be recognized and Kosovo Albanians can be told that, the, unfortunately, it's not on the menu for today, but it may come very soon. And uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, to liberate it in order to turn it back to the hands of Milosevic seems a little bit like, like, like going through, stepping on the same rake all over again and getting. <laughs> um, as um, for uh, Jennifer mentioned something about the the problem with the human rights and humanitarian problem and whether this is genocide or it isn't. I, I, I do not believe personally that this is genocide. I, uh, I believe that there are human rights violations. But I think that it doesn't really matter what we call it. We've seen what it is and we should intervene even if it's just a very, very bad situation for very, very many people. That's enough. It doesn't have to be some, somewhere in the Hague Tribunal or someone in the Geneva Conventions. It's enough that there, it means misery for half, half the population of, the, of, the, of this province. It doesn't matter what we call it, whether genocide or not. I don't see why because someone will pronounce one word, will send the, the Marines, and if they don't pronounce this word, they won't send in the Marines. And Kosovo Albanians have been, have been abusing a little bit the word, the word human rights violation in the past. I, I brought something here to give you an example. They would say that in a certain period there were 2,263 overall cases of human rights violations, and they will quote, three murders, three discriminations based on language, which probably means bad words about the language that they were using, and 149 routine checkings, and they counted as human rights violations. This was before the conflict started. Uh, they, they do uh, circulate some, some um, I don't know whether it's, it's rumor done on purpose or not, but it hurts a lot and it gives a lot, of, a lot of munition to the Serbs when they announce that most intellectuals or many intellectuals have been executed and then it turns out a few days later that have not been executed because the, the legitimate and absolute disastrous problem of half, half of the population of this province is being put to doubt because then the Serbs come out and say that, for instance, the, the, the Kosovo Albanians are going around to be counted several times on the border and things like this. I brought you something from the, from the Serb press. Uh, this is the, the, the pictures of the three people who were supposedly executed and the Serbs with big triumph say that the, the lie uh, is, uh, has lasted for a very short time. That's a, that's a propaganda success for them. I do understand that very few people in this audience would believe it, but when you do not watch CNN or BBC or read the New York Times, you may believe it, and a lot of people's minds have been turned like this. He's really a genius, Milosevic. If, if you had the kind of information that the Serbs have, you probably would, would share quite a lot of their views. So uh, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. As for the junky Soviet equipment, I think that uh, I, I agree, but the, the, with, with this junky equipment, they managed to do quite a lot of things. And if we want to have a technological war, Apaches versus uh, forks and knives with which they gouge the eyes of the Kosovo Albanians, I think that, that the Apaches will lose it. Can I let me, say something about the genocide? Uh, you, you can make a short comment on it, and then let me say we're going to go to the audience for questions. And uh, questions are short, uh, and students should be encouraged to ask the initial questions. But please, Jennifer, and then we're coming to them. You should line up at the microphones, which are here on the ground floor and on the first balcony. <clears throat> I, I agree with Anna that uh, there are occasions of, of grave, gross, sweeping atrocity, war crimes, crimes against humanity, that uh, require occasion, necessitate a discussion about the use of force to stop them. And we've had those, at least this last year in Kosovo, short of genocide. We've been using the word ethnic cleansing, which as you recall, when it first surfaced, 92, 93, was a word we all recoiled from. Now it's become part of the gradation of liming the definition of pre-genocide. And it's partly because we have been witnessing 
an escalation scale of at least observed human rights atrocities. There have been many this century, but in the last five or 10 years, we've all been flooded with it, and we're starting to struggle with language. And if you look at the Genocide Convention, people say, oh, well, the definition is in the Genocide Convention. Actually, there's enormous room in the Genocide Convention to argue just the way that Anna and I might. And people of enormous goodwill with the same sets of concerns and intent, which I would say, having met Anna for the first time tonight, she and I would be in that category, uh, it, it, I agree it doesn't matter, except that we need to begin to talk about what genocide really is, early genocide, pre-genocide, because there is a statement in the convention which says there is an obligation of one state or a state in connection and coalition with others to act decisively, to intervene, to prevent genocide. Mm -hmm. So that is where we are going to have to be talking as an international community. I can, can uh, notice from the microphones that we have a large number of people who would like to put a question or make a comment. I'm not going to discourage you from making a comment of a, a, a disagreement if it's less than a minute, but I'm also going to encourage you to put your questions in less than a minute, and we'll start here. Please identify yourself because this is taped for rebroadcast on public radio. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marcus Blasitz. I'm a, a student here at the Kennedy School, and I'll start with a very short question. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on, on possible options, ground force versus something else, and I guess I'm still confused a little bit with the overall means or overall objective. I mean, you have mentioned making Kosovo independent, keeping it with, within Yugoslavia, or having a kind of international protectorate. And I guess my question is, are these the only three options we have in terms of final outcomes, because all of them seem pretty uncomfortable and painful to the international community. Is this everything we have to choose from, or is there any other less painful uh, alternative we could look at? And if there is any, what would be uh, the, I guess, military <laughs> steps and risks involved in getting there? Thank you. Let's see. Steve, why don't you answer that, if you would, please? Well, I think those are the three alternatives, and I also think that uh, the middle alternative of a protectorate, which I agree with, with Graham, will be necessary. We're going to have to occupy the, the, the state and rebuild the state and create civil and political institutions for a couple of years. But that's merely a way station to an independent Kosovo. My question, though, is why people find that option so unnerving. The UN had 51 members in 1945 when it was formed. It now has around 185. Uh, we've had states proliferating and appearing in this world uh, at a rapid rate since 1945. Sometimes it's been botched, mismanaged, and horrible. Other times there's been no problem. We had a velvet divorce with uh, the Czech and uh, Slovak republics. We had a velvet divorce between the Norwegians and Swedes, as uh, you know the history. So, so Steve, once they become independent, if they want to join Albania, that's okay? Yes, that would be my position. It's, yep. uh, they're free then to self-determine. If they want to remain independent, good. If they want to join another state, good. Okay, uh, here on the left, please identify yourself, yes? Hi, my name is Erin Ashwell, and I was wondering if you could comment on the role that Russia could play and the likelihood that they will play that. Okay. Well, I had mentioned the Russians earlier, so I'll take the first stab, stab of it. I think, I think one of the unfortunate aspects of this is that, is that we have we have sacrificed a, uh, in a lot of areas, but in Kosovo is what we're speaking about now, a working relationship and, uh, with Russia to our, to our detriment. Uh, frankly, uh, I feel that, that if one of the things I said before we started shooting was the fact that I would have advocated putting public pressure on Russia to solve the problem or we would shoot in other words. Uh, and the other thing, uh, I think we should be willing to give them credit if they can, do, if they, and that may be the hardest thing for our administration to do, to give them credit for developing the solution. So I would like to see the contact group more active, more, more involved, and Russia's interests uh, promoted. Uh, I think in the long term, uh, it'll have greater benefit to NATO and to uh, uh, the United States, and if, they, if they're back in the dialogue. Well, maybe we could give them credit and credits as well, and they would work 
<laughs> they would work doubly hard. Yes. Yeah. In the, uh, we let could me work just, a package uh, deal. Yeah. Right. And I think along the same lines, if I can uh, be permitted a, a comment, uh, yes, yesterday the Vice President uh, Gore called uh, Primakov and talked about a potential diplomatic initiative. I suspect that if one went this route, though, you would have to lower your objectives. So this is the, uh, this is the stress in the, in, the, in the setting. Let me go to the balcony here on the left, please. Hello, my name is Piper Campbell. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. For the last, previous to coming here, I was living in Vukovar for the last three years, and it's um, very d upsetting for me to see that just as one problem seems to have been more or less solved, a similar situation is being created so close. Um, my question is for Dr. Lenig. You referred to the Kosovo verification mission. I have some friends who were on that, um, one of whom had been part of a UN mission in a part of Croatia which was uh, involved in the Operation Storm. And I wondered if you could expand a little bit on your comment about the problems with withdrawing the unarmed civilian mission and the gap that that leaves before a, uh, before a military mission option can come in. I, th I think that's very interesting. Be the prob the, my question, I guess, would be, is there any way to avoid having a gap? Is there any way to, to keep a civilian mission in without end endangering those people? And if you do pull them out, is there any way to avoid completely destroying the credibility of, of the OSCE or whatever mission is involved? The OSCE was involved in uh, an enterprise much larger than they'd ever done before. And they entered it with um, a number of people thinking with some skepticism that they would be up to it when they were um, called in in October. In fact, they ramped up pretty rapidly. And by um, late February, um, had established uh, many important bulwarks of institution building throughout <coughs> Kosovo. And they were deeply engaged in civil and politic, political human rights and economic work that created uh, a very viable network of ascertainment, visibility, accountability, and suppression of gross atrocity. Uh, I think the model is something that we should be looking at very carefully and thinking about introducing at other times, other places throughout the world. I was very impressed with it. Uh, and very impressed with the people. It was very international, very flexible, very open, a new bureaucracy, very welcoming to people who came, very, very um, engaged in outreach to the NGOs and the humanitarian community, very much linked and oriented towards local populations, intent on trying to bring in Serbians as well as ethnic Albanians. Uh, by the end of that time, because they were involved in working on human rights issues, they had become identified with the ethnic Albanians because the preponderance of issues that were going on were inflicted against the Albanians who were the majority population. And so by the end of it, there were many Serbians among the minority Serbian population that viewed OSCE with a fair amount of suspicion and mistrust. William Walker, who was the head of the OSCE mission there, considered that inevitable, although regrettable, because he worked very hard to bring Serbians in. I think that the gap, which was a four to five day gap, <clears throat> was very, very long, but it's only long to people who know how small, how small Kosovo is and how well positioned the Serbian forces were. There were many people who could have said, you give them four or five days without observation and no bombing, You're, you were basically sowing destruction uh, wreaked upon the Albanian population. But I don't think, so I think part of the reason is that they were trying to get diplomats out of Belgrade and other more vulnerable places, but that could have been coordinated. And now we're, now we're getting to very tactical details about how do you initiate a bombing on a country that has a mixed population of internationals. But in my view, it should have been much more tightly coordinated so that there was approximately a 24-hour gap before the bombing started. Those, 15, those 1,400 international people were evacuated from throughout Kosovo with their 400 vehicles in seven hours. So there was ample time to introduce bombing in a shorter, I mean, there was, there was ample opportunity to have planned to have the bombing gap be shorter. Okay. Another issue, though, could I just so say? Maybe quickly, because we have about 24 questions I beg your pardon, uh, waiting. Stop. 
Let me ask Anna if she want to make a quick yeah, comment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that probably Slobodan Milosevic would have accepted the, the Kosovo verification mission that would be composed of Belarusians, Ukrainians, Russians, and Chinese. This was his preference for the international. Otherwise, it, it, he was uh, utterly unimpressed by the fact that they had binoculars and notebooks and, and his boys had Kalashnikovs. And, Whatever they, they manage to do as, as building uh, civil society, I think when, when you face a thug, he uh, understands one argument, and there's the argument of force. They were there with the binoculars <coughs> watching Rachak and coming very, very quickly when the bodies were still probably warm and they could not prevent. So I, I did not think that this was a great idea, though I think that to come back to the question about the Russians, we could have probably gotten the Russians to convince Milosevic, that these people may be in danger of being attacked by both Albanians and the Serbs, and therefore, why don't they just wear a pistol, and then why don't they wear two pistols, and they would uh, end up with three Kalashnikovs each verificator, and, uh, and Slobodan Milosevic would be out, out fox. Soon we would have had the uh, ground invasion, yes, uh, just creeping. Mm. On the, the balcony on the right. Uh, good evening, my name is Marco Solda, I'm a freshman here at the college. Um, I have two questions which I would try to keep as short as possible. First one, um, as we know from Bosnia, the West, um, together with the three parties in Bosnia, um, signed the so-called peace accord in Dayton. Um, as Professor Van Evra alluded already, um, the Dayton peace accord can be seen as failed. Um, in one way, because in Bosnia we don't have any healthy democracy, uh, we know how the political parties are organized, but now we're facing the same problem within Serbia or within Yugoslavia, that after the military intervention, there's still be unhealthy democracy there and there's still potential for maybe another war. So what do you think the West should do after the military intervention within the so-called um, Yugoslavia? Um, the second question relates partly to the first one. Um, Mr. Nash, you said before that one of the possible options for a ground operation would be to get rid of the uh, Serbian government, the current Serbian government, which is the um, Milosevic um, administration. Now, the problem is if we get rid of Milosevic and um, maybe his counselors, who do we have next? They're only worse guys. We have Arkan, we have, um, uh, we have other guys like Sheshe. They're even worse. Those are maybe the worst megalomaniacs that we can find in Europe. So do you think it would be a right idea to get rid of Milosevic and his administration? Okay, good. Uh, let me see if we can get short answers first from Steve and then from Bill. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's to the first question or the second. Get rid of Milosevic. I, I think uh, we are uh, not very good at social engineering here in the United States, and we'll be far worse at it if we try to engage in it in Serbia. The problem in Serbia is not Milosevic, in my opinion. The problem in Serbia is Serbian nationalism, which is in a state of frenzied, narcissistic self-pity. Uh, Serbs wallow in their own uh, feelings of oppression about the past, and until they get over it, they're going to be a problem. And changing the uh, leadership in Serbia is not going to uh, make Serbia change its behavior, I don't believe. Okay. Quick comment from Bill? I agree. Okay, good. <laughs> this is uh, terrific. Uh, we're, 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 and it, only if, if other panelists feel violent about a statement, otherwise we're moving on. to the Back to the ground floor, please. Richard? Yeah, I'm Richard Sobel, and I uh, study public opinion about intervention policy. Uh, this panel is about what, what we should do in Kosovo. I don't want to tell you what I think, but I want to tell you what the American public thinks. I talked to Samantha a little bit, and she thought this might be some interesting background with the public opinion polls are saying, then maybe Bill or Steve Van Ever could respond to what effect this may have on what the United States may actually do. Five quick points. First is the American public sees the reason for this intervention as humanitarian. They're concerned about what's going on in Kosovo to the people of Kosovo, particularly the Albanians. Secondly, they don't see that the America's vital interests are involved in this. This is being reflected in some of the political rhetoric that is occurring. Third, though before the bombing started, there was a round majority, maybe slightly less support, there is now <coughs> strong support for the bombing. When the peace agreement was being discussed, there was mixed messages in the polls about whether peacekeepers should be sent in after a settlement. Some said the majority, some did not. 
But one of the most fascinating things is that in the last few days, the majority of the public, and in some polls, a large majority of the public, thinks that the U.S. should send ground troops. So we have a very interesting set of attitudes here. But the first two variables, I think, are going to be very important in how long this support is going to last. So I'm curious what the panelists think about the politics of this intervention based on these polling results. Good. You'd always leave it to a Harvard audience to have people with facts. So thank you, Richard. This is a good one. Any comment uh, uh, on that, uh, Steve? Or I believe in presidential leadership of public opinion in situations like this. I think that if the president decides to commit uh, his office to lead the public in whatever direction he wants, he can succeed. And, uh, uh, and if he decides he wants to fight the ground war, I agree there's going to be a big second guessing of this policy when we start taking casualties. And we're going to take some. But I believe he has the uh, ability, he has the power to keep the public on board if he wants. The problem with Clinton is he doesn't like to lead. He underestimates the bully pulpit. And he tends to look for the public to lead him but, but, and doesn't like to lead first. So the issue is whether he's going to lead, not whether he could. I think, I think the current situation gives the president and NATO, uh, and I don't know those numbers from the other 18 countries, but I think it's not overly different. Uh, and I think it gives great flexibility. I, I would like to point out, if I, if I could, that, you know, the, the period from September 1990 to January 1991 is, is the Allied forces built up in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. The, the building of international consensus for an attack on Iraq was was solidified. Uh, and President Bush, frankly, was masterful in, in the process he went through to build that cohesion, uh, at the same time building capacity. Now, Saddam Hussein uh, failed to understand. Frankly, I think my experience says that if you walk the walk, uh, then the the parties involved will listen uh, in Serbia. Frankly, when they see a lot of tough talk but no troops moving, that was the self-limiting statement that it was going to be an air-only campaign. That left the initiative to Milosevic. That left uh, uh, how 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 that left his determination against our determination. We were showing the limits of ours. A buildup of forces may well have eliminated the need to use them. One, it, may, it would not necessarily have presented, uh, prevented the initiation of the dire uh, events that we've seen. Good. The yeah. gentleman on the left. Uh, my name is Landrum Bowling. I've spent most of the last uh, three years in Sarajevo. I've spent a good part of the last nine months in Pristina and Belgrade. I'm in fairly daily contact with people on both sides. I am very much intrigued by this suggestion that the Russians should be involved. Uh, knowing something of that uh, option and knowing Evgeny Primakov personally for many years, I think he's a very skillful uh, operator and somebody that we could probably get to work a deal with us. But I ask myself, what kind of deal is he probably going to put on the table to us? I think I know exactly what he's going to put on the table. He will say, Rogova agreed to come forth to endorse an agreement with Milosevic. Milosevic promised he would withdraw his troops, he would allow the refugees to go home, and he would work out some form of Rabouye again. That is the thing that Evgeny Primakov will put on the table if you ask him to put something on the table. What do we say to that? What will our allies say to that? Will we have 19 nations standing behind us if we say no? I doubt it. Will we have the American public united if we say no? I doubt it. This opposition to ground warfare is deeply embedded now in the American psyche. Uh, Bill Nash and I have talked about this in the past. We don't totally agree about this issue. I, I, it's, an, it's a controversial one. I happen to be a Quaker by religion and an interventionist hawk by politics. Uh, I was one of those who threw out the Bosnian tragedy said we should have been going in there and doing something vigorous in 93. We could have done in 93 what we finally did in 95. And we would have saved a lot of lives. We didn't have the guts to do it. 
And let me say very frankly, and this is not with any disrespect to the military, of whom I'm extremely impressed with the skill, the professional ability, etc. But the fact is that this obsession with no casualties, don't put our boys at risk, we can't afford ground troops. The military helped a great deal to create that atmosphere of a public opinion that supports this idea of no ground troops. The military are wonderful, have a wonderful Teflon ability on this issue. Uh, Bill Clinton and the State Department and the National Security Council and all kinds of other people get the blame. There's enough blame to go around for everybody, God only knows. But I think it's going to be very hard to reverse 10 years of indoctrination that we cannot use our troops except for eight or nine, 10 points that have to be met. And no president has stepped forward with the courage to say that to us straightforward yet. I don't know whether, we have, whether the president has the courage to do that now, but unless he does, I would predict that we will have a serious, serious con uh, internal division if we try to send in ground troops tomorrow. Uh, a very useful uh, statement. Uh, I'll only recall uh, from an earlier incident when I was serving in the Defense Department after Somalia, a Marine, uh, the Commandant, uh, proposed, he said at a meeting, he said, Marines should not be allowed to have mothers, <laughs> was his proposition. So it's not only the military, it's their families that are a good part of this problem. There's no question. Go. Uh, I want to talk about the Russians a second. If you're, if the human, if, if we are willing to kill to stop the uh, genocide in Kosovo, if we're willing to kill in order to stop the genocide, why are we not ready to cut a deal with the Russians to stop it? Okay, if... Now, the, the point I'm making there is, is that we're, if we're approaching this in the cause of the preservation of human rights and the preservation of life and to stop the catastrophe that has occurred, uh, then let's cut a deal. Okay. Yes, but, but the, the, For how long? The deal, the deal w would have to be one that uh, had some stability and no, sustainability on the I ground. Agree. and. Uh, I think people who know Milosevic, know Kosovo, and know what has happened would say that it would have to include uh, a armed monitoring force to make sure that Kosovo is demilitarized in terms of the Serbians out, all Serbian military forces out. So the, if that could be negotiated, yeah. uh, and so it would enter as a protection force rather as, than as an invasion force, there would be obviously much greater um, possibility that lives would be saved on all sides. And that would be a great deal. So the question is, would Primakov put that on the table or wrestle Milosevic into agreeing to that? That's, that, is the, that is the problem. I would say the human rights community on, uh, I can't speak for the human rights community personally, I would say that we need to be in a position to establish the capacity to use ground forces as rapidly as possible and use them if we do not have through back channel a capacity to deal with a really good offer. Let, let me uh, uh, tell you my dilemma, and then we can, uh, uh, I'll tell you how I propose to solve it. The, 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 local, uh, the local work rules say that we stop at 9.30, and we've reached 9.30, and there's some people, obviously, who need to be somewhere. So nonetheless, if the members of the panel are willing, I would propose that we, for who wants to stay, particularly for people up with questions, take another 15 minutes. But for those that have somewhere where they have to go, we don't want to like, feel like you're trapped here. 9.30 is when the hour is supposed to be over. Uh, we're going to take short questions and short answers, and we're going to not necessarily, what we're going to do is take four questions, let people make comments, and then see where we are in terms of time. So if you need to go somewhere, please, uh, without embarrassment, uh, go uh, quietly. Uh, and then we're turning to the man on the right here. My name is Mark Stad. I'm a, a sophomore at the college. Uh, by no means do I disagree with ground troops. Uh, nonetheless, Americans uh, have become so accustomed to a zero-cost conflict almost since Vietnam. Um, after seeing the reaction from the three American uh, troops who were taken hostage and the incredible reaction from the American public, how do you feel the people in the US will react when they see hundreds of people dying? And is this a possibility of another Vietnam? 
Good. Uh, we're we're going to take four questions and then we're going to take four short answers. Here on the left. Hello. My name is Ziyadini Shahrozi, former head of the linguistic department. Um, I want to suggest that when you use the ethnic cleansing, it has the underlying assumption of the uncleanliness of the certain ethnics need to be cleansed. Secondly, when we use this euphemism, it uh, underestimates the uh, scope and the intensity of the killing. And if it is sort of the cover of the, if it is possible, we should be a little bit careful how we use this term. Uh, my question I want to pose to General Nash is, given the historical ties between Russia and the Serbian, given the internal opposition within Russia and within Duma against uh, any outside intervention uh, in internal affairs of the Serbia, um, given the fact any intervention, military intervention in the sovereign country has a repercussion inside the Russia, how can, how could the United States uh, ha have won over Russia? And that's it. Uh, I want to add it. The reason the U.S. got frustrated with the Security Council was the adamant opposition of the Russia and the China against the military intervention in the Serbia in the first place. And uh, my, I, I am sorry, let me, I last question posed to uh, Steve. Um, I want to say to you, secessionist movement or the independence, independence for um, Kosovo per se, it's not bad suggestion, but you will see that it has a worldwide repercussion in Asia, Africa. It's not uh, confined to the 100 or 200 nations. By, by my estimate, it can end up the 10,000 ethnic groups I would yeah. enumerate for you if you have the time. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're up here on the left uh, balcony. Yes? Yes, hi. Um, everybody's saying, oh, just send ground troops. I don't think that's so easy. Um, I have a question for Mr. Lubbers and also for Mr. Stephen van Evera. I think that's how your name is uh, said. Please, um, please quickly. Yes. Okay. How will you in identify the enemy? How will you distinguish between a civilian Serb and a guerrilla Serb? In other words, how will you fight an um, unidentifiable evil as you send in the ground troops? Okay. Um, that's the, so we take the fourth question from this right balcony, please. Right. I was just wondering what... Uh, please I'd identify be, yourself. I'm sorry, uh, Claudia Grebsky, I'm from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I was just wondering if you could comment perhaps on the objectives that NATO has. It has now acted illegally um, from sources um, who have consulted and been involved in the process. Uh, the humanitarian crisis could very well, or was actually anticipated, predicted, and the proper, I guess, um, uh, decisions were not made in terms of preventing it. And that even though you can blame the military in some respects, I, I think ultimately the decision probably lies very much with the politicians. So in terms of um, what precedent has set for itself now and what, what objectives it has ultimately within Europe or within the region um, in terms of ethnic, what, is it a police force for ethnic violation, um, humanitarian rights or other types of political issues or objectives? What would those Good. be? Thank you. It's a little jumbled when we have four questions, but I would say any one of the panelists can pick a question and answer it. Yes? You can take one. Yes. Uh, the first question, the, the acceptance of the American people for casualties, I would only offer uh, the case of, uh, of Desert Storm, where prior to the attack, the estimates of casualties were, were great in number, very high estimates and that the American people had been prepared for the cause and, and the righteousness of the act, and they were prepared to accept those casualties in the name of freeing Kuwait. If the same case is made uh, for Kosovo, I think they would prepare it. And I think, your, uh, I think your hundreds dying is in the same league as the pre-Desert Storm predictions. Sure. 
Anna will knock off two questions, so good. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to say that ethnic cleansing is very handy for journalists because instead of spending two paragraphs explaining how one ethnic group is throwing out the other one which is minority in this territory, we just say ethnic cleansing and it works and people know what we, what we mean. This is basically why people are using this. I don't, I don't think that the, the, the fact that it's cleansing makes anything uh, dirty. It's dirty the way it's being done. As for the civilian uh, uh, Serbs or, or the guerrilla Serbs, I think that if we can deal with the Serbs in uniforms, whether they have written here uh, Polizia, Milizia, or, or Vojska, Yugoslavia, or Yugoslavska Naroda Armia, or something like this, it doesn't matter. Let's, let's just make them stop do, do doing the bad things, and, and this will be question two and three. Thank you. Uh, uh, I love a, a short answer to two questions at once. Steve, you have I'll one question I'll just speak briefly left. to yes? the precedent issue, which yes. is an excellent question. You're right. There's about 7,000 language groups in the world today, and there's about more than 500, I'd say more than, well, nearly 300 major ethnic groups that are stateless, and we cannot apply the uh, principle of uh, self-determination uh, to the point of sovereignty. Uh, everywhere. It's a recipe for chaos. So how do we control the precedent effects? I think it's not difficult. I think it's easy to explain that Yugoslavia is a special case, that um, the disassembly of Yugoslavia was uh, bungled and basically illegitimate, and that the states, the new states of Yugoslavia were recognized prematurely. The Germans never should have recognized Croatia. These states should have taken on much more obligations than they did before they were recognized. And our position should be, sorry, did it wrong, recognized them too quick, we still have the right to, to um, uh, uh, reconsider the borders and make new demands on the central governments and make some changes here. I think we can make that case and distinguish Yugoslavia from the rest of the world easily. Okay. Please. Uh, I just think that the question about the objectives of NATO is a very good one and it can't be answered now, but the fact that NATO is now engaged in a set of actions that is putting its credibility at risk for humanitarian and human rights issues. Uh, is a good place to start to evaluate what it should be doing into the future. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going one more quick round, and I'm going to then be, I think, unfortunately, that's going to be how much time we have. But stay down here on the ground floor, because I think the balcony, balcony microphones are empty balcony. right now, yeah. so you don't, don't come to the thing, please. Here, Stacy. yes. All right. Um, my name is Stacy Sullivan, and I'm a consultant here at the Human Rights Initiative, and I've also covered the conflict both in Bosnia and in Kosovo. Um, I have two questions, and I apologize for that. The first one is um, about the Kosovo Liberation Army, and we don't hear very much about what's happened to it, and clearly they're, they're down on their knees right now, but they're not, um, they haven't gone away. It's a determined, might be a group of thugs with guns, but it's a pretty determined group of thugs with guns, and there's a lot of them. Um, we've also seen um, how the Serbs fight. They're very good with uh, heavy artillery and, and bombing cities, and they're also very good at shooting civilians, but they're not very good at hand-to-hand um, -hand fighting. I know that conventional wisdom is that um, an air campaign alone won't work, but I wonder if it is too naive to, to think that perhaps the air campaign, coupled with maybe um, defections from the ranks of the Serbian troops, coupled with a very determined group of um, Albanians with guns, if, if we could not see um, some kind of solution through the KLA, and if not, what the KLA's um, role should be in any kind of uh, outcome for this. That's my first question. Well, the second question yeah. is... Yeah, quickly, um, please. Yes. Okay, Anna's point about how Serbian television has thoroughly indoctrinated the, the population to the point that ordinary Serbs actually do believe that the Albanian refugees are fleeing NATO airstrikes and that they're walking around in circles so that their numbers will increase. Um, I'd like to know, um, this is a question for Bill Nash, um, why, how difficult it would be to take out Serbian television, and if, and this was done in Bosnia, and if, if it's not very difficult, why NATO hasn't done it? Thanks. And we'll go to this gentleman here. Yeah. Hello, my name is Maksim Grudin. I'm a scientist in Miros, uh, which is a software company in Wellesley. I have uh, two questions. One very quick, it, it, um, the answer might be one sentence. The second one might be a little bit longer. The first one is, why has the NATO been reluctant to operate under the wing of OSCE so that uh, Russia, maybe some other countries could also uh, work with them? Because uh, it's all 
uh, talked about as NATO-led forces. It was the same as I remember in, in uh, Bosnia. As eventually it became S4, but uh, Russia was demanded to operate under the wing of NATO rather than OSCE. So that can be a one sentence answer. And the second answer, uh, question is, uh, as far as I know in Turkey there is a very big bad situation with Kurds uh, and uh, the, their leaders are being repressed and uh, sent to jail. Whereas in, in Kosovo I think that the leaders, uh, they live in, 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 in cities and I don't think that they're being chased. Um, do you think that if we judge Turkey by the same standard as we judge Yugoslavia, as NATO judges Yugoslavia, then uh, there would be uh, kind of some kind of uh, sanctions against Turkey too? Good, good question. Uh, let me see what the members of the panel, if you want to take one of the questions or two. I'll take Stacey. That was just two questions. Th those were just two uh, questions. Four. Okay. If these will be less than a minute questions, I apologize. Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, Taylor Siebold, I'm a research fellow here at the Kennedy School at Graham's Center, and uh, for full disclo disclosure, Steve Enever is my dissertation advisor. Um, the question is uh, to Anna Husarska and, and Steve Enever. Um, Anna, you said that arming the KLA might be a good idea. They seem like pretty nasty people without much of a uh, political center to them. Um, giving them a lot of guns doesn't necessarily sound like a good idea to me. Um, Steve, I think your logic leads to uh, camping out in Kosovo for a while. Uh, who would be our allies? Uh, Rugova seems to have been discredited. I don't know how many people are behind him. Uh, if it's not the KLA or Rugova, then who? And how do we work with either of those two? Okay. Um, a very quick question, please. Hey, my name is Ron Newman. I'm not affiliated with the school, but um, Good. my concern is about the seemingly indiscriminate nature of some of the bombing, bombing Vojvodina, bombing Novi Sad, bombing in Montenegro, doesn't this make a lot of enemies of people who we need to have on our side if this, is, if this military mission is going to have any chance of success? Okay, good. Uh, I think we go along and take it. Anna, take yeah. any questions that you want to answer since you do them so briefly, please. Okay, I'll, I'll take the Ucheka then uh, first. Uh, a little bit both, both, both uh, of you asked the same question about Ucheka. I, I do sincerely think that uh, the, the independence for Kosovo should be recognized as a legitimate goal. This would make the, the policy of this government a little bit easier. Then arming of the UCK wouldn't be such a, such a tremendous contradiction in terms because we cannot arm people whose goals we don't recognize. And as for the factions uh, of the Serbs, I don't know where they would go. I mean, who would welcome a defecting Serb? In, under, his, <laughs> under his roof. Um, what is the role for the UCK? They have already found themselves a role. They have nominated four ambassadors already, and, and the government is basically a, a UCK-led government, the one that Hashim Tachi has, has announced. So I think they have found themselves a role. And to, to answer your question, you said that I said that they are nasty guys and shouldn't right. be given guns. I, I did not say that they are nasty. I right, said no, you should, they should be given guns. I said they're nasty. I don't think they are nasty. I think they are unruly and not very politically sophisticated. I think that they are fighting for independence. I think that the UCK is really a state of mind of every Kosovo Albanian and not, and not an army. It's, there are as many soldiers in the UCK as many, as many guns are available. Everybody would, would fight there. I think that if we arm them, but at the same time recognize their goals, then maybe we can attach some strings like compulsory lessons and Geneva Conventions and things like this. We would somehow be controlling them if we start arming them. We cannot not recognize their goal, not give them the guns, uh, not allow any smuggling of the guns and then and then expect them to 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 fight. This is not right Okay uh, Bill you want to answer some other questions? Uh, no, but the restriction the bombing the TV tower is uh, is a relatively easy process uh, Obviously there's collateral damage in uh, uh, Considerations that that I don't know about where it is et cetera, et cetera. It's not just one bomb. It'd be a network uh, I can't explain to you why they have not taken that out, except uh, with the, most likely the hope that enough news will get through to show things. And oh, by the way, we really kind of enjoy seeing the pictures of the effects of the bombs. 
an alternative. Yeah, Prince <laughs> yeah, right. could start filming something. Uh, alternatively, uh, and one that I would consider more, more is, is we have the capacity to override the TV and put our own shows on. Okay. And I, uh, well, it, it's, it takes a lot of uh, energy uh, in terms of power, and it requires a more uh, uh, safe env air environment to go and do that for an extended period of time. You can shoot in and put a s statement in for a short period of time, but to overwrite some time. Um, I do not understand the targeting. I do not understand why we have established uh, target, uh, used targets in uh, Montenegro in particular, in the Novi Sad area. In, in that area. I can't completely explain that, except it seems like we're fighting a military fight instead of a political fight to me. If, if I may add something to the, to the propaganda war, I think that we have not done enough to inform the Serbs from independent sources such as could have been mounted in Montenegro. I would imagine that if, if we understood a little bit more how the Serbs think and operate, the, the people from Vreme magazine, the people from the B-92 should have been allowed to come to Podgorica and set up their operation there and from their uh, voice, the opposition to Milosevic, maybe together with the opposition to, to the NATO airstrike, if, if such is their feeling. And if you are bombed, probably your feeling is against the bombs that fall on you. I mean, that's only natural. Taking, taking those, those transmission towers, I don't know why it's so difficult. The Russians have been, have been jamming Radio Free Europe all my youth. And, uh, <laughs> Good. Then, take Offer. the Russians on board and they yeah. will do it. Well, you see? <laughs> you see? I knew you'd come around. Um, the OSCE versus NATO is a very interesting uh, issue. Uh, and I will tell you that because of the experiences of uh, the dual key issues associated with the UN in Bosnia, the difficulty of building consensus with 19 nations, and the established rigorous chain of command in the military structure of NATO, there's great hesitancy to, to turn over. Uh, many country, many members of NATO have a great difficulty in assigning their forces to an organization with, with less structure and less unity of, of command. So, especially the U.S., yes. Especially the U.S., but not alone. No, but not alone. Jennifer, do you, do you want to answer a question? Just, or just yes. point about the Kurds. Uh, it is, it's very true that there are uh, gross human rights violations going on against the Kurds in many settings, particularly in Turkey. But I would say that the scale and the intent and the systematic um, work against the ethnic Albanians in Kosovo in this last year would place it in a separate category from what's currently going on with the Kurds. Steve, whichever questions are left. I'll speak about the Kurds and the KLA. I'll just say about the Kurds, I agree with the sentiment of the question. I think the Turkish treatment of the Kurds has been the great disgrace of NATO for many years, and that uh, the rest of NATO should have long ago pressed the Kurds to become civilized in the way they treat the Kurdish minority, uh, not only discriminating severely in every regard you could name, all the way up to refusing to recognize the existence of a Kurdish identity until recently, to operating death squads today who have killed hundreds of people, you know, sort of reminiscent of Central America. And uh, I think this shows where it leads. I talked earlier about the need to press regimes for minority rights if you want to head off civil war and partition. That's what we've got to do in Ma Macedonia. That's what we've got, should have done in Turkey. Um, the, the problem where to go now with the Kurds is far more complex because it would cause a huge upheaval throughout the Middle East region. We just can't talk about it. And, and sh it, we, we disrespect the question if I say anything quick. About the KLA, I would say we um, shouldn't fall in the trap of idealizing those who are on our side uh, while we are demonizing those we are struggling against. There's almost an iron law in, in the uh, um, laws of motion that govern revolutionary movements, which is they tend to attract the worst kind of people. They do. Uh, they tend to attract people who often really ought to be in prison. Uh, uh, folks who are attracted to the use of violence in their personal lives are attracted to movements that create the opportunity to practice it for politics. It's a problem that movements that are going to use force have to bury themselves against. And it's a problem that those who deal with them have to be aware of and ready to deal with. And I think dealing with the KLA down the road, this is why I think we have to occupy Kosovo later. We're going to have to um, uh, control the influence of the KLA in Kosovo. 
I I'm going to I'm gonna leave. I'm going to give Anna the last word. Yeah. I'm Bridge. sorry, but sure, Steve yes. has awakened in me a militant <laughs> Ucha Ka member. <laughs> I, I, I just can't believe it. I mean, for 10 years, the young people have been sitting in basement learning their history and in mosques and, and learning underground, having parallel clinics. Nobody paid any attention to them. Nothing. No television, no journalists. Nobody was coming. Rugova was saying, just stay there, don't do anything, it's too dangerous to do anything. Then the students decided in October uh, um, 97 to go out in the street, Rugova again told them stop, don't do anything, stay at home, etc. If I were a, a young Kosovo Albanian, I'm neither a young nor Kosovo Albanian, I would grab a gun just like they did because that, that's, that's the kind of... Uh, the, the level of the accumulated anger has got to, 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 to such a degree that something had to be done and they knew very well that gun and blood brings journalists and journalists brings the first page of the New York Times and the first page of the New York Times brings attention of this uh, government. That's it. And, and I think that uh, on this note, uh, we uh, can ask, you know, at this stage, are they better off? than they were before, okay? We could ask, and each of us can ask ourselves, what would we do if we were making policy tonight? You've heard a number of different views. We'll all get a chance to watch this case and see when and how we were wrong. Okay? And unfortunately, this is a real world. Yeah. It's continuing on and people's lives are at stake and people's lives are being affected by the actions of governments, but mostly here at a school. Most of us are at a distance. So we have an opportunity to analyze a case unfolding in the real world, thinking about what should have been done in the past and what should be done today. And unfortunately, I think this case will be with us for some time. But for illumination tonight and a very interesting discussion and for a terrific audience, let's say thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. 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 Hi